This chapter, we're going to be looking at how the social structure works and why sociologists use their two different perspectives, the macro and the micro perspective. We'll talk about the different components of the social structure, and we'll also discuss the ways in which theorists understand social structure and what binds social orders together. We'll also be looking at the different theoretical perspectives and how they would view the social structures. Sociology looks at the social world from two types of perspectives, the micro and the macro. Macro sociology looks at the interaction at the individual level, what happens during social interaction. Examples of this could be things like facial expressions, how people talk to each other, what kinds of relationships people have, and where they spend their time or their money. Macro sociology considers the broader perspectives of society. Social class or social stratification, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and how groups of people relate to each other or their power differentials. Those would be ways in which macro sociology is studied. This slide helps illustrate aspects of the macro and the micro perspectives. The power and social structure from the macro perspective is evident by the Capitol White House in the background, while the isolation and the daily experience of the man laying on the bench, as well as his personal social class and lack of power, help to illustrate the micro perspective. Both perspectives are valuable to sociologists. You can't fully understand society without seeing both perspectives, although almost all researchers will use one or the other as the basis for their research. Studying the social structure lends itself to the macro perspective. Social structure refers to the typical patterns of groups, how individuals react within those groups, and how the groups operate amongst themselves. Unless we live in total isolation from the rest of the world, as on a mountaintop with no interaction with others or the world around us, then the social structure is all around us. Even if you lived in isolation at a given point in your life, the experiences you had in society also form the basis of your beliefs. Our social structure dictates how we interact with the rest of the world. Your text author's example is the idea of coming back years later to your alum school to watch a football game. Even though all the players have changed and the different positions are filled by different people, the functions of the positions are the same. The game depends on the roles or the social statuses of the different players. The plays might change, but the roles of the players don't change. The same is true for society. The players change, but the roles and the statuses for those roles stay the same. We'll look now at the different components of the social structure, what they mean and how they operate. These components include culture, social class, social status, roles, and groups. We've already talked at length about culture and how it bonds us together, and how it allows us to have a shared common way of understanding the world. It also makes people who are not like us or who don't share the same way of knowing the world, don't share the same culture, feel very different from us. Social class is generally based on things like income, education, and educational prestige. Those are the main components, but not all of them. Often people in a specific class will share similar interests. We talked before about social locations and how those would impact where in the social order you would be viewed. Our social class is probably the most important self-identity most people have and will also determine how the rest of society views the person. Social status is referring to the position someone occupies in society, and it's different from social class. 
status is the position that someone occupies in a social group. So you could have low social class, but still have a great deal of status, depending on how the other group members view you. Or you could have high social class and lower status. If you were wealthy with an education, but took on a low status job, you might not be treated as a high status member of society. There are other important aspects of status. Status sets refer to the different statuses you occupy, son, daughter, student, parent, worker, etc. Ascribed and achieved statuses refer to whether we are born with a certain status or earned it. Were you born into a middle or upper class family? Or did you move into that status? So an ascribed status would refer to being born into a middle or upper class family. An ascribed status would also be if you moved into that status because of your age, say you became a teenager or a senior citizen due to your life course. Those are ascribed statuses. They are involuntary and they don't just happen by themselves. Achieved statuses are voluntary. They happen because someone makes them happen. High school or college graduation is achieved or being the president of a company is an achieved status. These can be positive or negative. High school dropout is due to action or inaction. Whether you get the label of criminal or bank president has to do with your actions. Status symbols refer to things that designate our status, like a wedding ring or an expensive car or a uniform that signify who we work for such as in law enforcement or the uniform the UPS driver wears. We generally find ways to display our status. Can you think of ways in which you display your status? There's also something called status inconsistency, which occurs when there is a bit of a mismatch between our statuses. For instance, a high school student that's also a parent, that's a bit of a mismatch, or a truck driver with a graduate degree.